Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll be talking about the IoTivity Constraint project. It's an open source project that was released a few months ago. It uh, runs on a range of constrained hardware and software environments. Uh, it's designed to build uh, IoT applications based on standards by the Open Connectivity Foundation. Uh, I'll speak about some of the design choices that we have made in the project, and hopefully by the end of the talk, it should become apparent as to the fact that uh, similar design philosophies would apply more generally for any IoT standards-based uh, software. So this is uh, sort of the outline of the talk. Uh, I'll start by int introducing uh, the Open Connectivity Foundation and the IoTivity Constraint Project. And uh, briefly introduce you to the uh, the OCF standards. I'll speak a little bit about the characteristics of uh, constrained hardware and software environments, uh, followed by a discussion of IoTivity constraints architecture at some depth. Uh, I'll provide some guidelines on porting IoTivity constraint to new environments, and uh, end with a discussion of how you build applications. So the Open Connectivity Foundation, OCF, uh, was set up in an attempt to address the M2M fragmentation problem. Uh, it's an industry-run consortium uh, which aims to collaboratively develop and publish uh, a set of communication standards for IoT. Uh, the IoTVT constraint project is a small footprint implementation of the OCF standards. Uh, it has a lightweight design and runs on uh, constrained hardware and software environments. These might be typically uh, battery powered and wireless devices like a smart door lock or uh, a sensing platform, for instance. Such devices might, might be connected themselves to a constrained network such as a low power and lossy network. Uh, and such devices typically run small OSs like uh, Zephyr, Riot OS, or Contiki. Uh, the the architecture enables uh, of the project enables it to be quite easily ported and customized to any platform. This is uh, kind of an essential and important attribute, just given the variety of uh, available hardware and software options. So having a flexible design enables the project to be uh, used by a wider variety of users. Uh, so that's more people looking at the code, potentially more contributors, and a more robust implementation. Uh, and also, to that same point, uh, the people who would benefit most most, most from this project are uh, embedded, embedded IoT uh, developers or makers who would like to tweak their application in OS bundle to a very fine-grained level. So the OCF standards, the OCF uh, Protocol is based on the REST architectural style where all things are modeled as resources. Uh, so CRUDEN, which stands for create, re retrieve, update, delete, and notify operations might be performed on these resources via standard verbs, uh, get, put, post, and delete. The things communicate to, with each other by exchanging resource representations. Uh, <clears throat> The schemas for all of these representations is completely specified by OCF. Uh, the observe or notify operation is a special case of the get method, which lets you subscribe to notifications from a resource when there's a change in its representation. Uh, resources are generally uh, defined with a set of standard properties, common properties. They have a URI, which uh, identifies a particular physical object. Uh, you have a resource type. Uh, which mentions a type. You, resources are tagged with one or more interfaces, where an interface uh, sort of describes all of the set of the set of operations that might be performed on the resource and the nature of their representations. Uh, OCF completely specifies a set of standard resource types and interfaces that might be used. Resources might uh, have one or more policies associated with them, such as whether it must be discoverable or observable and any implementation would act upon these policies. And lastly, resources uh, can also be assigned a friendly name. Uh, OCF, the OCF standard also describes roles uh, which are embodied in applications. The server role describes an application that uh, 
hosts a collection of resources and exposes it to the outside world. A client application uh, accesses resources hosted on a server and you can have an application that incorporates both roles and such an application might, for instance, run on a gateway and serve as an intermediary. The OCF standard also declares a few well-known resources which are just there and serve uh, specific functions. The OIC slash res resource is uh, basically used to perform resource discovery and it takes discovery requests. Device and platform are two logical concepts in OCF and their well-known resources expose some metadata such as uh, manufacturer, OS and other firmware details. The OIC SEC resources serve as interfaces to the uh, OCF's security model. And likewise, there are some other well-known resources which you can learn more about by looking at the OCF core specification. So with the OCF protocol, the wire protocol is based on the constraint application protocol co-app. Uh, resource discovery, as I just mentioned, is performed with the aid of uh, the well-known resource OIC res. Endpoint discovery over IP is usually performed using multicast requests. Uh, OCF data payloads are encoded using the concise binary object representation C board, which is a compact data format. Uh, OCF also describes uh, the security model, describes mechanisms for uh, authentication and encrypted communications over DTLS, and uses access control lists to restrict access to resources. And you can read more about it by looking at the security specification. The, uh, the OCF standard primarily re relies upon UDP as the transport, but uh, there's been some work to adapt it to uh, Bluetooth via the generic attribute profile, and there's still an ongoing effort inside within OCF to refine and standardize the scheme. Uh, so I'll just go over a few uh, simple request response examples here. So for resource discovery, the, the, you have two devices here, which is where the smartphone runs probably a client application, and you have an OCF branded light bulb running a server. In order to discover resources, the client issues a multicast get request, the OIC REST resource, to just find all resources around. Uh, the, uh, the light bulb on receiving this request sends back a unicast response with, uh, and its representation mentions its URI, uh, a, a slash light, and also the fact that it's a light, and that it, it is uh, also observable, it supports the observe operation. So as the client is interested in operating this light bulb, it now sends a unicast get request directly to that, uh, that server endpoint and that re uh, addressing that particular resource with the get request. And the the uh, the light bulb responds with uh, sends a unicast response with its with its current representation, which is state equal to zero and dim equal to zero, its brightness level. The client uh, wants to turn on the light bulb, and so it sends a unicast put request, and including a payload of uh, state equal to one and brightness equal to like fifty. The server receives this request and uh, uh, basically. Uh, acts upon it by turning on the light bulb and setting the brightness level and sends back a success status via a unicast response. Uh, the client now decides to uh, basically perform the observe operation and, and subscribe to notifications from the light bulb. So it sends a unicast get request with the observe option set. The server takes note of that subscription and sends a unicast response back with its current representation, which still remains state equal to one, dim equal to 50. So in this example, the light bulb happens to be connected to a, to a physical switch, which somebody has turned off. So the, the, the bulb, so essentially the, the state of the, uh, the bulb represent, bulb's resource representation has changed. And so it sends back a notification to the client indicating its current state of uh, state equal to zero and to equal to zero. So uh, I'll now speak about a few <coughs> characteristics of working in constrained environments and some of the challenges that they pose. But first to understand what it even means to be constrained, uh, I'll quote from RFC 7228, which presents a constrained device classification. RAM and flash sizes were uh, 
the key dimensions along which the authors of this RFC observed a clear clustering of commercially available MCUs, which resulted in these three classes. Uh, class zero devices are severely constrained, uh, and this, they could be something like a tiny sensor mode. In the best case, they might be connected to the internet via a gateway or a proxy. Uh, class one devices are less constrained than class zero devices, but they still have limited code size. And as a result, they might not be able to accommodate a complete protocol stack to talk to other internet connected nodes, and they might also lack certain security features. But they might still be able to accommodate a, a protocol stack built specifically for constrained environments, such as the constrained application protocol. But even so, it might not leave sufficient resources available to an application. Class two devices are much less constrained than both class zero and class one devices. Uh, but their resources can be utilized more effectively by building software that is just generally lightweight, leaving uh, sufficient room for building a more, more and very capable application. But generally, we have the challenge uh, here to accommodate the operating system, the network stack, any drivers, the IoTVT constraint framework, and the application, all within these constraints. And based on our experience, uh, and thus far, with a few OSs, we have found that it's generally hard to overcome this challenge on a class zero device. Uh, it might be possible to deploy an application on a class one device by doing a very optimal selection of uh, features, but we can very comfortably fit within a class two device. Here are some typical uh, characteristics of constrained hardware. We've already spoken about low RAM and flash sizes. So what this means is just not that we need to build highly optimized software, but uh, also the fact that the, uh, the RAM size limitations tends to also constrain the certain runtime parameters of the application, such as uh, maximum number of buffers for request responses and maximum payload sizes, and these directly impact the serviceable workload of that application. And this is something we need to be aware of. Uh, also, it, it pays to build software that is modular so that you could uh, include only those features that your application needs and cleanly exclude everything else. Uh, when you're working with low power CPUs with a low clock cycle, uh, you need to basically build software that is not heavily over-engineered. Uh, code paths should be kept lightweight and uh, which are hot spots. And uh, we should do minimal copies. While working with uh, battery powered devices, we should ensure that our code doesn't do any uh, sort of busy work. It should be made to take advantage of uh, idle periods uh, and periods of inactivity to put the CPU to sleep, because this leads to better execution efficiency and hence power conservation. But however, in order to further address this need, we are currently looking to extend the OCF uh, standards to incorporate a, a specialized application profile for constrained devices that would potentially limit the responsibilities of such devices from a networking perspective. To give you an example, we, would ex we could expect a battery powered device to periodically go to sleep. And so it shouldn't be required to, to listen for multicast requests. And if so, uh, it would mandate that we uh, deploy some a rich intermediary device that uh, sort of serves as a reverse proxy to the constraint node. Uh, this is the sort of stuff, this is an example, but this is the sort of stuff that we are currently trying to study and we are looking to hopefully incorporate it in those CF standards moving forward. So these are some typical uh, uh, software characteristics. The operating system itself is usually small and lightweight. It might lack the necessary capabilities on its own. Uh, leaving us to rely on, potentially rely on third party or proprietary libraries. Uh, there, there usually is no support for dynamic memory allocation, which is something that we take for granted on uh, full featured operating systems. We could statically allocate memory, but if we do, we should put a lot of thought uh, upfront into the size of those allocations to, uh, because they, they, they directly impact the performance of the application. 
Uh, also, there's considerable fragmentation in the APIs and programming models amongst uh, OSs. There, there are also variations in the uh, design of their uh, execution context and the scheduling strategies that they employ. Uh, for instance, they could be like preemptive or cooperative, like Riot OS uses, supports multi-threading. Uh, Kantiki essentially uses cooperative multitasking. Uh, Zephyr supports both uh, preemptive and cooperative threads that can serve different purposes. But the point I'm trying to drive here is that it's very, it's generally hard to write a piece of software uh, against one set of OS and libraries and have it easily port over to, to another unless we specifically design it for that purpose with that goal in mind. So just to summarize, uh, after sort of addressing a lot of these pain points that I just discussed, uh, here's a brief summary of all of the features that we have been able to support in IoTivity Constraint. It supports the, the uh, OCF client server roles, uh, resource observations, separate responses, resource collections. Uh, it uh, has utility functions to encode and decode uh, OCF's uh, data model. Uh, it executes the OCF protocol and handles it all internally and exposes a set of high-level APIs to applications. Uh, it also supports the co-op blockwise transfers feature, which is RFC 7959. This is an important uh, feature, ex especially in constrained deployments, where there tends to be uh, limitations in the layer 2 MTU sizes. Taking Bluetooth and 802.15.4 as examples, uh, we, ha we could use L2, L2 cap or the 6 low pan adaptation layer to do uh, fragmentation and reassembly of application data. Uh, but this uh, sort of makes it, uh, if we rely on those blocks for that purpose, then it sort of makes it a bit transactional, perhaps a bit error prone. Uh, and it needs to sort of, and we also incur the additional cost of, uh, let us the network stack incurs an additional cost of creating and uh, buffers, more multiple buffers and maintaining state. But this state can be uh, managed slightly better in the upper layer closer to where this data originates, thereby eliminating the need to actually handle buffers and uh, maintaining state in the lower layers in the network stack. This is essentially the, uh, the benefit of blockwise transfers and an IoTVT constraint application can uh, optionally take advantage of it by setting a prescriptive MTU size at compile time. Uh, an application needn't do anything to utilize this feature because the, the framework automatically launches off a blockwise transfer if uh, an application data payload exceeds that prescriptive uh, size. Uh, IoTVT constraint also supports a minimally viable uh, implementation of the OCF security model. By uh, It supports one of its uh, onboarding methods, uh, provisioning of credentials, and the access control mechanism. Uh, you can read more about it in the OCF security specification, which supports a range of security modes. I'm sorry? Can you handle out-of-order sequence? Of uh, what? Yeah. You mean when you're doing it blockwise? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't. That, that wouldn't happen because uh, every block is acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So I think the question she asked was, can co-op handle out-of-order uh, uh, reassembly if you use a blockwise transfer? And my answer was that since every block is essentially uh, acknowledged at the same time, uh, that's one of the benefits because you're maintaining all of the state at the upper layer. So you're not going to be sending the subsequent block until the first block has been successfully transferred. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, discuss the activity constraints architecture. So based on a lot of the concerns we discussed in the previous slides, these were sort of the architectural goals that we arrived at and I, which are all fulfilled by activity constraint. Uh, it consists of a, of a core block, which is built to be cross-platform and encompasses most of its features, which is the 
uh, OCF protocol, resource model, uh, application layer functionality, memory management, and execution. This core block uh, interacts with uh, platform-specific functionality via a set of abstract interfaces. These interfaces are defined in very generic terms and uh, elicit a specific contract from their implementations. Since the core block is the sole consumer of these interfaces, the definitions of these interfaces are very simple uh, and they're very limited and bounded. So this lends itself to be very easily uh, sort of implemented on any environment and, uh, and thereby IoTVD constraint can be quickly ported to and deployed on those environments. Uh, it statically allocates all memory, and the size of these allocations are specified at uh, build time. And lastly, it's highly modular and configurable, so you can uh, sort of cleanly exclude some features without affecting the rest of the system in your, in your compilation. So this is the architectural uh, diagram with a depiction of whatever I just spoke about. The, you have the core block there in the gray box, uh, which talks to these uh, these abstract interfaces. These interfaces cover only a specific sets of lower level functionality, which it needs, which is access to a system clock, uh, a pseudo random number generator, uh, the network stack for connectivity, and some form of persistent storage to basically persist and retrieve uh, credentials for supporting OCF security model. Concrete implementations of all of these, implement of these interfaces is basically of what we call a port. And uh, this can be built for any OS network stack or libraries, uh, lower level libraries. So are, are these existing ports? Yes. Yeah. So we, we currently support all of these ports in, uh, for, um, which are present for uh, Zephyr, Riot, Contiki, uh, Minute, and even Linux. Uh, <clears throat> and on the left, you have an application, an IoT application that uh, runs on any one of these OSs that uh, speaks to APIs exposed by the core block. So this is uh, sort of a, a, a depiction of all of the constituent pieces of the core block, which is sort of like zooming into the gray box on the, from the previous slide. So on the right, you have uh, blocks that uh, implement uh, OCF's resource model protocol and security flows. And all of those blocks interact uniformly with OS level stuff, OS specific stuff uh, via the abstract interfaces that I spoke about. The blocks on the left uh, perform more horizontal functions like working with uh, OCF's, uh, the memory pools and uh, as well as uh, handling the internal execution of the framework. The framework executes in an event driven fashion uh, where uh, Data is passed between inter internal modules uh, via the propagation of events. The core block maintains an, an uh, event queue internally of a fixed size, which uh, holds all the uh, all outstanding events that were posted by any of these modules. And uh, the uh, events are processed by the receiving module in the order in which they were initially posted. Uh, so an application essentially needs to run an event loop and some background task in it to execute the framework. Uh, the code implementing the client and server roles are kept distinct and so that an application could choose to include either uh, of them or both uh, using compile time switches. And lastly, uh, the core block exposes a set of uniform APIs that an application may use. So this is a more... Uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of e internal deep dive into how the uh, uh, the event loop executes so essentially you have the application that runs the event loop the OC main pole function inside of a loop uh, and continually calls it every call to it processes all outstanding events at all of these uh, all of these internal blocks at, as of that time uh, so an, an, an application also registers a set of callbacks from the core block. So the connectivity uh, block essentially uh, uh, 
is, is uh, anticipating uh, in incoming messages over the network, and when it when something arrives, it uh, passes that buffer up to either the uh, the security or messaging uh, blocks, based on uh, depending on whether the incoming message was encrypted. The security block passes passes a decrypted message up to the messaging block. The messaging block uh, uh, sort of passes the co-op packet and uh, sends the result up to the resource layer, which ends up mapping it to OCF uh, constructs, and uh, eventually calls back into the application to either uh, handle a response for a client or handle a request in the case of a server. In addition, the application itself can post events into the framework for uh, processing, and this might, an example in which, you know, of which of where this might happen is in the in response to a hardware interrupt from a sensor. So uh, w one thing to take note of with the event loop design is that uh, it has it it gives the application an opportunity or at least a task to enter uh, a tickless idle mode during periods of known periods of inactivity. Uh, an application basically registers a callback which can be made to sort of wake up the, uh, the task that's running the event loop. Uh, the, the, the code over here uh, sort of illustrates a pattern by which this can be accomplished. Uh, you initially have, on the top, you, have, uh, you can initialize a semaphore uh, and essentially launch off the event loop. The event loop, uh, the uh, OC main pole function returns a value which could either be, which is essentially an absolute timestamp. Uh, it's either the absolute time of the next scheduled event that's known or zero if there is none. Uh, but in either case, the, uh, the loop can subsequently wait on that semaphore for either that known uh, time or until that known uh, time for the next event or indefinitely. And this callback function can be uh, made to signal that semaphore to resume execution of the task above. The framework automatically invokes this callback uh, when there is new work, either in the form of an incoming request or if an application uh, posted an event to be handled. And so in this way, the, the, the event loop isn't really running. There's no work. When there's when there absolutely uh, no activity, it doesn't run and it just has, it can just sleep and the CPU can move into a to a deeper sleep state. So uh, I'll now speak a little bit about uh, porting uh, iotivity constraint to a new environment. So as I earlier mentioned, uh, the core block interacts with these set of abstract interfaces which need to be, uh, which need to be implemented for a specific port. And essentially, the, the whole task of porting the framework to a new environment boils down entirely to implementing these interfaces, as everything else is OS agnostic. Uh, to give you an example, here's uh, the uh, structure of the Zephyr adaptation, where uh, the adaptation layer, that's the Zephyr port, directly uh, invokes APIs uh, from Zephyr to access its uh, clock, network stack, storage and some other kernel APIs, and, and as well as a random number generator. Uh, the stack below, it's a simplified stack diagram of the Zephyr OS, where you have the hardware platform, uh, the, uh, above which you have the kernel and drivers and the BSP for that platform. Uh, the drivers interact with various features that we use, such as the uh, uh, either the random number generator or uh, storage for flash and things of that sort. Uh, it supports 802.15.4 uh, Ethernet and uh, uh, Bluetooth as the layer two technology. And on the top you have uh, support for UDP, uh, IPv4, IPv6, and as well as other Bluetooth host functions. And uh, you, so you can you can once with the existence of a Zephyr adaptation layer, you can write your application for Zephyr, and you would compile both 
IoTVT constraint framework, the application and the Zephyr OS all into a single binary and which you would then flash onto your device. So speaking, getting to the interfaces themselves, here, here's the clock interface. Uh, in order to specify this, you have to specify a, a resolution of the clock that you would like to use. So clock is uh, the, um, the IoTVT constraint tracks time via clock ticks. And uh, obviously, higher, higher the resolution, the more precise uh, timing that you can achieve. Uh, the interface itself consists of only the initialization of the clock and obtaining the current time, which, for instance, on Linux, you can implement using clock get time. Uh, the connectivity interface consists of implementing uh, initialization, sending a buffer to a remote endpoint, sending a discovery request, uh, and like getting an assigned uh, DTLS, uh, assigned DTLS port. <clears throat> and this is, all of the other details below these are implementation dependent. Uh, the OC message T structure, it's again an abstract structure which tracks uh, and maintains the remote endpoint information as well as a data buffer which contains your request or response. So on the receive side, you could uh, uh, basically look for incoming uh, network traffic either through polling or via a blocking weight in a separate task. But essentially, when you get your, in either case, when you get your uh, uh, an incoming message, you would construct an OC message T structure and pass it up to the framework uh, via the OC network event uh, call. But <clears throat> however, the OC network event call needs to be synchronized with the execution of the event loop. So in case you're calling that from a separate thread, for instance, if you're, if you're uh, basically blocking on a select on socket file descriptors, waiting for incoming traffic. You pr you'd presumably do that on a separate thread than the thread that runs the event loop. And in that instance, <clears throat> you would need to implement these functions to uh, using the synchronization primitives of that OS that you're targeting. And that would uh, internally synchronize the two threads and, and guarantee the synchronization. This is the interface to the uh, random number generator. You would uh, uh, you could choose to employ any uh, seeding strategy as a part of initialization if necessary. And uh, the framework calls OC random value to obtain a, an unsigned integer. This is the uh, interface to uh, any persistent storage that you want to support. Uh, OC storage config is meant to implement uh, some sort of an initialization function, and it takes a parameter which could be some reference to an area of storage. OC storage uh, read and write should implement uh, as a part of the contract and defined specified by this interface. It needs to implement access to a key value store because the framework internally just reads to and uh, reads from and writes to keys. So I'll, I'll uh, move on to, I'll, I'll walk through a few application code samples to give you a sense of the APIs. Uh, so typically, uh, an application in IoTVT constraint consists of a series of, implementing a series of callbacks. Uh, you have an initialization callback, which is, needs to be present in all uh, applications. Uh, you have a callback for defining and registering resources, which you would do on a server application. Uh, you would need to implement resource handlers for all uh, over all supported methods on those resources in server applications. Uh, you would need to implement response handlers to all issued requests in client applications. And you would also, you could choose to define an entry point for issuing requests in your client, which is invoked shortly after initialization. You have to, of course, run the main loop, the event loop in your uh, in some background task in your application. And you also need to configure uh, a set of parameters uh, to fit the needs of your application in this file config.h at uh, build time. Yeah? Does the spec define uh, failure scenarios? Uh, in 
for which return values for I, th I think, I mean, as far as the protocol is concerned, it does return, it does define some values that you need to return, but uh, it doesn't really get into implementation details. Anything that you would consider an implementation detail is outside of the scope of the spec. I think the spec really covers more at sort of at the co-op level. So this is, this is sort of the background task in your application where you would initialize stuff. Uh, this could very well be your main function. So you would create an OC handler T structure and populate it with the initialization, uh, resource registration, and the event loop signaling callback. The structure is then passed to OC main init to do the initialization. And upon successful initialization, you would uh, launch the event loop. Uh, this is an example of an initialization callback where you would, in typically, you would be expected to populate the platform and device resources, which, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, are two well-known resources and expose uh, metadata on the operating system firmware and OCF spec versioning information. But you could also use this callback to do any hardware-specific initialization, depending on your deployment. Here's the uh, resource registration callback where you can see that we're defining a new resource with URI a slash light, resource type uh, core dot light. Uh, it supports the get method and sets a, a resource handler get underscore light. That's the callback for the get method. It's also marked as observable, so it supports the observe operation. Uh, this is an example of the get light resource handler, which is called uh, whenever the server application has receives a get request to that particular resource. If this callback, uh, uh, so the cl a client is free to pass in query parameters uh, along with your request, much like you would do on, on in HTTP. And uh, if the if a resource handler accepts queries, it can read them over here using the API. But basically, uh, the, the semantics of the get method is that it, should, it has to return a representation of that resource, which is precisely what uh, I'm showing here. Uh, in this case, it consists of an object, which is a map with two properties, uh, state and brightness level. And um, that's being encoded and returned here in this function. Uh, IITVT constraint has macros, which you see here, that you could use to encode your representations. So to do resource discovery on the client side, uh, at the, the, the line at the top uh, shows you an example of how you're dis of discovering a particular, uh, uh, all resources of type OICR.light and sets a, a response handler to the discovery request, which is discovery. And, uh, so essentially, at this point, it sends off the multicast request with uh, appropriate serialization. And, and the, the discovery callback is called for every, uh, every discovered resource, overall uh, responses that come back to the framework um, on the receiving end. So inside of the discovery callback, you know that it's called because you asked for resources of that resource type, that's something that you, you're expecting. And so you would make a copy of the, ser of the server handle, which contains information about the remote endpoint that hosts this resource, as well as its URI. Uh, because you would use this information subsequently to issue a request to that resource, which we do uh, right here. So with, now that we have the server handle, handle and URI, we'd use the OC do get uh, function to issue a request to the light resource. And in this case, we also pass in a query parameter uh, units uh, to basically select the desired uh, units of values in the representation that it returns. And we also set a, re uh, a response handler here, get light on the client side. Uh, whenever when, when, when to, to process the response from the uh, server. So in the get light uh, response handler, basically the framework, when it receives a response, it uh, passes the payload and then creates an OC rep T 
structure, it get, which gets handed into this function. This is a structure that the application can simply walk through in this fashion to retrieve all of the key value pairs contained in the representation, which is uh, what you see here. So I, I spoke about the uh, framework configuration. So these are some of the parameters that you would configure to suit your needs. So you, you'd have to set the number of application resources that you want to support, that you are supporting in your application. Uh, number of request response buffers, which has, uh, which impacts the number of requests that you can concurrently handle. Uh, the payload sizes, uh, MTU size, if you want to support uh, blockwise transfers and DTLS related uh, parameters. So this is something that you specify at build time to match your specific application. So once, you, once you've written out your application and, and as well as uh, set all of your parameters in the configuration, you need to build it using your target OS's build system. Taking Zephyr as an example, uh, you would use Zephyr's build system, which uh, is based on kconfig. Uh, you could either specify a config file containing all of the OS configuration parameters, or you could use its menu config interface to do that. These are some parameters that you would uh, certainly have to specify, at least the ones that are highlighted, like the stack size of the main thread, the implementation of some implementation of the random number generator, the number of network contexts, which is really Zephyr's implementation of a socket, number of send receive buffers and data sizes in the network stack, and uh, the uh, network transport and layer two options uh, that you see. If you want to support uh, six low pan uh, adaptation layer as well as the header compression scheme, that's something you could choose to add. If you're using Bluetooth, you could select from among the host options like the uh, central peripheral uh, roles, one of them. Uh, generic attribute profile or L2-cap connection oriented channels. So, so this is again something interesting that you can do in, with Zephyr, which I thought I'd point out. So the Zephyr's network stack uh, has an implementation of RFC 7668, which is uh, transporting IPv6 traffic over Bluetooth low energy. Uh, the mechanisms by which this is accomplished is fully documented in, by Bluetooth. Uh, in the Internet Protocol Support Profile IPSP. Uh, so basically you can, since as Zephyr supports this, you can build an IoTVT constrained uh, server application as a six low node uh, using these options. That's I, six low IP header uh, compression, the Bluetooth peripheral mode and L2CAP connection oriented channels, which would result in a six low node type uh, uh, device. Uh, and uh, Zephyr also includes a sample implementation of the IP support service, which is again something that's specified in the IPSP and uh, something that you need to use to establish a connection with from the master, that's the central. This is actually supported uh, and something you can try out today on the Arduino 101. Uh, question? Yes. It's supported on, on the 101. Do you know how many resources are left over for actually writing a program once you've got this loaded? Uh, I'm not sure how to quantify that. I mean, I've actually run samples yeah. that we have. So. So I think the question he asked was, okay, once we have all of this built up and running on an Arduino 101, how many resources do we have left over for the application? How much run and how much flash? Right. I mean, I don't have the numbers with me right now, but uh, uh, I, 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 I think, we, I think uh, based on what I remember, I was kind of approaching the RAM limits on the Arduino yeah. 101 was uh, the time, but, but yeah. Uh, but but you can test this out, and this works on Linux. You can use the Linux as a as a central device, and uh, you can use the Zephyr documentation to uh, for instructions on how you how you both set up your Arduino 101 as well as uh, uh, 
uh, establishing a connection on the Linux side. So, in conclusion, I mean, uh, the project is progressing steadily. Uh, there is growing interest in the community as well as prospective OCF vendors who are looking to use it. We are still uh, tracking uh, and hoping to achieve full OCF spec compliance. We are pretty close as it is. Uh, we are looking to participate in an upcoming OCF plug fest to put it through a series of interop tests. Uh, I, I, something that I'd mentioned earlier on in the talk was about defining a constrained device profile with and extending the OCF standard to support that. And uh, we're looking to use this implementation to actually run a series of experiments and uh, to aid in uh, coming up with that definition. Uh, we, we hope to work with uh, OCF's industrial and healthcare task groups to understand um, you know, where they're heading in terms of direction and looking to see if we could do any uh, sort of prototyping with an IoTivity constraint to support those verticals. And lastly, we are also looking to add uh, uh, additional higher, higher, layer, higher level components, anything which is of utility, uh, such as, you know, like maybe uh, interacting with, a third, with, the, with other third party services and we could have them reside in the project as mini libraries which an application could use. And as, as always, we, uh, you know, we very much look forward to um, you know, community involvement and more contributions. And I think there, are, there might be opportunities to further optimize some of the core blocks. So, so that, that was my talk. And you can, you can get the, uh, that's the pointer to the source and the mailing list, and you can contact me if you have any questions. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, since you already have a minute sort of port, can right. you maybe very quickly talk about uh, how can I integrate from the min minute side? So, or any operating you know, system like that, right? You know, because minute, for example, has this concept of uh, packages, you know, which is basically like an external library that I can take. Right. Is it as easy as just pointing at something and you know, saying that's an IoT? Uh, so, so the minute port in specific was done by contributed by runtime.io, and actually, uh, so they have a fork of the project on their repository, and they will be upstreaming it at some point soon. Uh, so I don't know that specific question, but for any other, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I I I don't I don't see anything particularly limiting in the design of the framework itself that would prevent you from doing that if you have had infrastructure to support what you're suggesting. Yeah. Uh, regarding resource management, uh, you know, uh, you specify a realistically low, low number of resources in your build. If you have a network that seems to return a lot more, maybe you find out how by accident. Right. Any strategy to try to roll them in a way such that you can, maybe you can't catch them all in one, uh, or one query, but you can at least get them at some point later, or is the only alternative is to try to reveal your, your code? Uh, so you're, you're saying that, okay, if you were to issue a discovery request and you get back a series of responses. Yeah, and, and you limit it because you define already at build time. Right. The number of resources. Well, I define at build time the number of resources that I, uh, I expose as a server. Oh. Okay. But I don't define how many resources I receive. And it's, I'm at liberty as a client application okay. to decide how many resources I want to review. But the discovery request itself is uh, has a lifetime of uh, I don't know a few seconds, within which you you, you receive all the responses that you receive. And you're not going to be able to be overwhelmed by the large number of expected responses. Uh, it's really more of a server side. Right. I mean, yeah. On on the client side, where you actually uh, issue discovery requests and process these responses, you are at liberty to decide. So you wouldn't be processing any more than you've already accounted for upfront. Okay. 
Great. So because you require, you can uh, you can query some specific class for that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So the yeah. So like in that example, we asked for a specific resource type, and that's the way to actually do it. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how does the multicast discovery work over Bluetooth? So over Bluetooth, uh, at least for GAT, uh, it essentially does a series of unicasts by by connecting. Yes. So actually, for for GAT, we have defined a, a GAT profile and a GAT service with a specific UUID for OCF. And so those connections are uh, essentially when you want to discover, you would have, uh, and the server side is advertising, and you establish that connection, and then you actually uh, you 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 uh, transport co-app directly on that on your LE link, and the server side responds if uh, there's a matching resource. So on DLE, if you're doing the DAX profile, um, you had to pair, and then therefore. Yes. It takes care of that. Exactly. Any other questions? Okay.